They cannot grant any titles of nobility on a person, but then neither can the United States government. Be aware that all the things we've just mentioned are not a complete list of everything in Article 1. There's a lot more we just don't have time to go through. But we've saved back a couple, a couple of things in particular that were or are especially controversial. Let's start with 1, 2, 3. Article 1, Section 2, Clause 3, usually in history referred to as the Three-Fifths Compromise. Okay, this was about the question of how many representatives in Congress a state would be entitled to. Remember, the more members of Congress you get, the more political power you have. So what the framers said was that we would have a census, that is, count the population of the country, and then each state would get members of Congress based on its proportionate share of the national population. Fine, that's how it's done today. But in 1787, there was another factor called slavery. Let's say two states had exactly one million people each. That is to say, one million free people. But one of those two states also had a million slaves while the other state had no slaves. Well, the leaders of the slave state wanted their slaves counted in the census, thereby giving their state twice as many representatives in Congress, twice the political power. The people in the free states might have said, wait a minute, if you were going to let your million black African slaves vote and elect some black African slaves to serve in Congress, then that might be fair. But you don't let them vote. You don't even let them learn to read. So if your slave state was entitled to twice as many congressmen, it would just be wealthy white slave owners electing other wealthy white slave owners to go to Congress and supposedly represent the best interests of black African slaves. You know, that ain't gonna happen. The issue, the argument there in the secret convention, probably represented the single biggest threat to having a constitution at all. We don't know who said what. Theoretically, the delegates opposed to slavery perhaps could have gone ahead and formed a slave-free country. It might have had six states with an opposite country to the South, but not likely. It was more complicated than that. Former Arizona legislative leader Art Hamilton. People always believe that it was in fact the South that uh, certainly supported slavery and the North always opposed. What I certainly found out was that exactly is not the case because much of the northern economy, particularly after, with, the, with the advent of, of industrialization, became dependent upon, upon uh, making cloth. That cloth depended upon cotton. Cotton was the major resource of the South, and to make that economy work, depended upon slavery. So an awful lot of people in the North decried slavery, but were perfectly content to let it exist in the South because economically they benefited from it as well, though they would never admit it, that it brought any profit to them. In the end, the delegates agreed to count a slave as three-fifths of a person in the census. I've had friends say, how dare they to have counted my ancestors as only three-fifths of a person? Counted a slave as a whole person would have given the southern slave owners even more political power in the Congress. As it was for the next 70 years until the Civil War, slave-owning Southerners exercised more than their fair share of influence in the U.S. House of Representatives, and for that matter, in the Electoral College. And then we come to what is likely the biggest argument about the Constitution. We say biggest because it is still an ongoing argument some 200 years later. Article 1, Section 8, Clause 18. It says, Congress shall have the power, quote, to make all laws which shall be necessary and proper for carrying into execution the foregoing powers and all other powers vested by this Constitution in the government of the United States or any department thereof. This is known as the Necessary and Proper Clause, the Elastic Clause, and the Implied Powers. It goes by all of those names. In effect, it says, hey, we here in 1787 don't know what's going to be important 100 or 200 years from now. So we're saying the future Congress shall have the power to pass any necessary and proper laws dealing with any future situation that seem to make sense. However, and we're getting a little ahead of ourselves here, 
But a couple of years later, the states ratified the first 10 amendments to the Constitution. The conflict lies with Amendment Number 10, which basically says that any power in the Constitution that isn't specifically given to the federal government is automatically left to the power of the states. The other side says we, the Federal Congress, can do anything that is necessary and proper to carry out the intent of the Constitution. It's like an argument over who's in charge here, the Feds or the States. It is a fact that more often than not, historically, the winning side of the argument has been that the Congress has the authority to do what it deems necessary and proper. But the Tenth Amendment advocates continue to argue their point. The bottom line is that we're not going to settle the argument here. And one other little interesting story about legislative authority. Article 1, Section 8, Clause 17 allows for the creation of what today is called Washington, District of Columbia, D.C., the seat of government. The article says that such a district may be no more than 10 miles square, that's 100 square miles, and would be from land donated by some states. So Maryland and Virginia in 1791 ponied up, donated the land on either side of the Potomac River and all was well, not quite. After a while, some people, especially in Virginia, had second thoughts. They were concerned that former Virginia residents, now in the District of Columbia, had lost their representation in Congress. There were also complications related to the slavery issue, which you can read about on the internet. The bottom line is that in 1847, the Virginia part of the District of Columbia was given back to Virginia. Today, the nation's capital is not 100 square miles, but 69 square miles all of which was donated by the state of Maryland. And residents of the nation's capital still do not have a voting representative in Congress, and certainly not a U.S. Senator. The office of the presidency as we know it here in the 21st century is a world different from what was written in the original Constitution. I don't think I'm too far off base in saying that the original 1787 presidency, as outlined, was only a little bit more powerful than a modern day high school student body president. Jefferson, who was for limited power, probably loved it. Hamilton, who was for a strong executive, probably hated it. There are only six little clauses outlining the presidency, as compared to more than 50 outlining the structure and the powers of Congress. So the Constitution says the presidency and the vice presidency are four-year terms. What's interesting here is that originally they had an election and the top vote-getter became president and the first runner-up became vice president, even if they couldn't stand each other, sort of like a Miss America contest. In short, they didn't run together as a ticket. This later got changed in the 1804 election with the 12th Amendment. Section 2 of Article 2 says the president is the commander-in-chief of the military. What, what is little known is that this commander-in-chief business is not a military rank. Even though soldiers salute him, or someday her, commander-in-chief is a civilian position, consistent with the approach that our military is under civilian control. Next, among other things, it makes clear that the heads of government departments are not independent, but they work for and answer to the president. Then it says the president can grant reprieves and pardons. He can appoint ambassadors and judges and make treaties, etc., with advice and consent of the Senate. It says he has to inform Congress as to the State of the Union from time to time. These days, it's usually a speech. Years past, it was in writing. He has to make sure that laws are properly carried out. That's why we call it an administration. But the most interesting one is that he can force Congress to adjourn its session. There may have been one, but I don't know of any historic situation where a president has done that. But the interesting fact is that originally the powers of the president, as written in the Constitution, were pretty puny. It has been the personalities of presidents and circumstances that they have faced which have transformed it into the powerful institution it's become. Then we have Article 3, the judicial branch. It has only three sections. The first section creates the Supreme Court and notes that Congress can create lower courts as needed, which you'll recall is already noted in Article 1, the powers of Congress. 
It says federal judges serve, quote, during good behavior, end quote, meaning it's a lifetime appointment unless they exhibit some bad or illegal behavior. The section also says they will be paid for their service.